welcome to News Click. I'm Paranjay Guha Thakurta. 75 years ago, on the 15th of August, 1947, India became politically independent after nearly two centuries of British colonial rule. In this edition of this program, I discuss what happened then, what is happening today? We look back and look at the present and maybe look forward as well with a senior journalist and author, a person who's worn many hats in his life, who was barely nine years old when the country became independent. He was born on the 22nd of December, 1938. Welcome Prem Shankar Jha. Thank you, Paranjay. And a brief introduction to you. Um, born in Bihar, in Patna, educated at some of the most well-known, the elite educational institutions, Doon School, Dehradun, St. Stephen's College, University of Delhi, Modlin College, University of Oxford, worked with the United Nations Development Program, joined uh, the leading English daily newspapers, Hindustan Times, the Times of India, Economic Times in senior positions, uh, was a media advisor to Prime Minister Vishwanath Pratap Singh, has been a consultant and a member of various international committees and national committees, author of several books, including books on India, China, and Kashmir, visiting professor, scholar at several Indian and international educational institutions. Thank you so much once again, Prem. You were barely nine years old. So your memories of the 15th of August, 1947 must be very vague or very fuzzy. But surely as a young man, you, you knew or you understood what quote unquote freedom, what these words meant, independence. So if you look back what happened 75 years ago and look at where we are today, let me have your initial remarks of where this country has traveled in the last three-fourths of a century. Uh, Paranjay, first, um, I, I, I don't know whether to thank you or, or, or to do the opposite for almost embarrassing me with your, with your list of my, my, my educational and other so-called achievements. I didn't have much to do with it, actually. I, I was very fortunate. I was among the fortunate. But I will say one thing, that I was conscious of being an extraordinarily uh, fortunate young, uh, very young person at that time. And my only desire throughout, even when I was in the UN uh, and in New York and then in, in, in Damascus and Syria, was one day to just get back to India and work. Work meant being working in India. And I'm, I'm glad I've came back and I have, in spite of everything that's happened, I have not regretted one instant of the last 75 years or after I came back the last 55 years. If you want me to sort of give you a one line um, uh, statement on what you said, and I think I can do it, it is to say that I am profoundly disappointed. And I would say I'm close to despairing uh, for, the, for the future of our country. So the promises that, uh, or, or the hopes, not promises, I should say, the hopes that many people had, including you, when after 1947, during the tenure of the country's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, they seem to have been completely dashed today. For the present regime, the, the, the Narendra Modi government, which has been in power for more than seven years, Jawaharlal Nehru seems to be a very, very dirty word, a dirty name. How come? Yes, Paranjay, I think I don't want to leap straight from 47 till today. Uh, will you allow me to sort of um, say a few things in between? Yes, I, I, I was very proud of Nehru's India. I was fortunate enough to have met him as a college student, first in, in, on, on Republic Day in 1957 and then at Oxford in 1960. Uh, I was both thrilled by him and also, I must tell you, when I met him in 1960, somewhat disappointed by him because the Nehru we met in 1960 was tired and was beyond his prime in many ways. Um, you know, I think just too much responsibility for too long. But whatever, uh, I think that the, the 
the tragedy is we had so many ideals and we actually started so rightly. I mean, the constitution is, is about as, 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 as ideal as possible. Much more important than that, it is unique in the sense that it has created a framework within which something like 15 or 30 major ethno-national groups, which made up India before, um, were able to come together and form one modern nation state, state without any resort to violence. If you look at Europe, there's not a single nation state that has been formed there without violence. In fact, violence was the, was the tool of the formation of the nation state. We managed to do this in India through consultation, through a long struggle, a unifying struggle against the British, tragi tragically marred by partition, but not totally destroyed. And having done that, having created this extraordinary, um, you know, what, 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 versatile, I mean, and, you know, uh, and, and diversified, diverse country, um, diverse secular country, democratic country, we have managed by a series of short-sighted decisions taken by a succession of administrations, starting from the very earliest days of our independence, we have managed to bring ourselves to a position where, where today we are a country without law. We are a country without any kind of self-respect. We are a failed economy. We have a hundred million young people, more than a hundred million, who have, you know, have given up looking for jobs. At this moment, we are in such a terrible situation that 38 million people, 20 million of them daily laborers have lost their jobs in the last four months. So to say that I'm disappointed with our performance, it would be an understatement. You talked about how India, one of the biggest strengths of India was the fact that it was so plural, it was so heterogeneous. We're the only country in the world with 17 languages in, the, in our currency node, including English, which is not in the, the eighth schedule of the constitution, which has 21 languages, you know, in terms of culture, in terms of every, every conceivable way, we are arguably the most diverse country in the world. Yet, yes. we see in the recent past an attempt to make India homogeneous, the, the, the Rashtriya Swayam Sarvak's, you know, goal of creating a Hindu state because 80% of Indians are, are Hindus or are supposedly Hindus. How do you see this transition from heterogeneity to attempts at making India a kind of a homogeneous country? Attempts, I say. It's, it's a, a, a semi-literate uh, attempt to, to, to turn the clock of history backwards, make it run backwards. The ideas that Savarkar began with, I have no, have no, no complaint about those ideas because they were the ideas of 1925. And they were very appropriate at that time. That was the height of the nation, nation state period. If you wanted to make a nation state in India, you, 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 know, you would naturally think of the way that nation states were created in Europe. The fact that India did, was not amenable to that was yet, it was too soon to tell at that time. We've learned in the last 50 years that that was not the right way to go. And in fact, the right way to go was in fact to, to make a unity out of diversity as we succeeded in doing between 1947 and 1957. So, but the point is, this does not, the fact that Savarkar was wrong does not, does not make him some kind of, a, of, an, of an evil person or anything. It is the way it's been interpreted today, 75 years later, that the, that world of the nation state is gone. Look around you, it's a globalized world. And to try and go back to creating a nation state, which in any case impossible, you know, let's face it, with the kind of diversity we have and the, the way that our ethno nations have learned to use this diversity and to establish, and to, you know, you know, establish themselves and to assert themselves you cannot go back. You can break up India completely, which is the direction that the, that the, that the BJP RSS are going in, but you will never be able to make it, make it into a single homogeneous country. That is a completely impossible dream. So I think that we, have, we are facing a situation where a crisis of identity of India as a single nation is what they're driving us towards. 
that that was very well expressed. Uh, so you you you've been an economist. You've studied economics. You a lot of your articles deal with uh, the political economy and the economy of this country. You talked about India today being a failed economy. You talked about the large numbers of young people who are unemployed or given up looking for a job. You've talked about people who've lost their jobs in the recent past. Now, when you look at you know sort of the transition of the Indian economy from the so-called Nehruvian model to Indira Gandhi's so-called socialist model, and we move on and we move on to Narasimha Rao, 1991, uh, the uh, 30 years ago period of liberalization. And today, over the last few years under Narendra Modi, what do you think, what has been the transition to the economy? At one level, they're very right-wing in their views. They want to sell off the public sector. They want to privatize as many as uh, PSUs or public sector undertakings as possible. At the same time, this is the same, this is the same regime which talks about Atman Nirbharta, which is well, self-sufficiency. What are your comments? Well, the... Uh... You know, they, they don't know their elbow from their shoulder. There's a, there's a, there's a cruder de 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 phrase for this. I'm not going to use it. But let's say they don't know their shoulder from their elbow. Um, they, they, don't really, they don't know what they're doing at all. They have absolutely no idea what they're doing in the economy today. Um, the, the, the problem with the, in the, in the econ economy at this moment or has been since 2011, how do you revive the growth that took place between 2003 and 2011? Um, first of all, that growth was killed. It, had, it would have revived automatically and continued. It did revive. Uh, when the, in 2009, when the global economic recession followed the financial crash of 2008, Dr. Manmohan Singh called in the Reserve Bank of India, the chairman, and told him that you must lower interest rates and against his will somewhat the chairman the, the president uh, what do you call it? the governor the reserve bank governor. agreed yes. the, uh, go the governor agreed and for two years after that we had he the fear with always was inflation if we if we do if we allow the demand to, 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 to run away in fact for two years we had a 12 percent growth rate of industry and a one percent inflation rate but in 2012 again, 2010 and 11, the RBI for its own reasons, again began raising interest rates. And from that point onwards, they kept raising them continuously till 2016 for five years. And the, there's no economic logic behind what they did because they kept citing an inflation that didn't exist. Inflation was being measured in India by the cost of living. And, and, and not by the state of demand. The cost of living index in India, 60% of it reflects the shortages in infrastructure, housing, transport, travel, education that we have, at which keep pushing these prices up. Not in excess of demand. Only 8% of that cost of living index actually is an area in which there's, you can clearly see the rise in the for the demand. So having done that, they pushed up interest rates when the economy was already slackening and there was a worldwide recession and the economy has just continued to crash. Okay. This began in, this began in the in the Manmohan Singh government period, I must say, and Modi took advantage of it. But Modi has made it worse and worse and worse and worse. In and then fact, COVID in fact uh, if I'm just interrupting you, uh, you talked about recession. For the first time in the history of this country, in, 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 in the six months uh, starting on the 1st of April 2020, India went through what some describe as a technical recession. We had negative growth in two successive quarters. And for the full financial year, there was negative growth. And, and even now, whether it's Prime Minister Narendra Modi or Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman or government officials, they keep talking that the worst is over, the Indian economy is going to revive, and some people say this is going to be a, a V-shaped kind of a recovery. Are you as optimistic? Uh, are you optimistic in this regard? I just briefly mentioned what I read today in the Standard, I think a few days ago, 
um, uh, the latest est estimate by the CMIE, 38 million jobs have been lost. Workers' jobs have been lost in just the last quarter. 38 million, 20.3 million of these were daily, daily workers. We have 42% of our workforce, non-agricultural workforce today, consists of casual labor. You're de defined as being employed if you have as, as few as three days of work in a month. The 6% unemployment rate that we have today, and still is now risen beyond that, but we don't know the latest figure, is for people who have absolutely no jobs, not even one day a month. That is not the European definition of unemployment. By the European definition of unemployment, we have a 40% 40, 40 unemployment rate. That's how bad the situation is. You know, these are, when you are a casual worker, what, what is your job security? What, what happens to you if you're, if you're ill? What happens to you if someone dies? What happens if you have to go home suddenly? If you don't, what happens if you don't get a job, uh, uh, get work three days in a row? How do you live for the fourth day? Okay. You know, the, 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 the degree of insecurity in which human beings are living in India is, I think, unparalleled. There have been short periods, periods of war, Afghanistan, of periods of famine and drought, sub-Saharan uh, sub Africa, but continuously, Consistently, and as a result of the government's own policies, no, 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 no working class, no population of a country have been as systematically, you know, re, you know, reduced to helplessness and penury as India. Don't take the GDP figures into account, just because because the overall figure just tells you the total GDP. But the way that income in, in, in differentials have have have, have widened, I'm, 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 I live in golf links, which another elite uh, thing that I have. Next to me are three houses, where each house has three Mercedeses and BMWs parked in front of it. The whole of this colony is like that. You, now, you know, I... <laughs> I mean, I mean, what you're saying is inequalities of income and wealth have grown rapidly. The stock markets right. are, stock markets are booming. Been, uh, the, the rest of the economy is in a mess. What we see yes. is uh, oligarchs and crony capitalists doing rather well, while, while the rest of the economy is, is, is in a terrible shape. Well, would that yes, I, I do. I, I, I do. Yes, absolutely sound, Paranjoy. I don't, as a rule, use terms like oligarch and crony capitalists, capitalists because they have so many meanings and they've been, in a sense, overused. But the truth is that we have our own version of economic oligarchs in India, and they have got, oh, we are extraordinarily rich, you know, and they have not the faintest shame about their wealth. That, that bothers me. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, more than anything else, that bothers me. There is not, not the faintest sense that we owe something to the people around us. Okay. They're blind to misery. Let me change topics a little bit. Uh, you know, in between 19, June 1975 and March 1977, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, the then Prime Minister of India, imposed an emergency. We know what happened in March 1977. She lost power. She, of course, returned to power, but that was in January 1980. A lot of people argue that what we have been seeing today, or what we are going through at present, is a kind of unwritten, unspoken emergency. Do you agree with this view? If so, why would you say this is an unwritten or unspoken kind of an emergency? Uh, it is. It is. Uh, an ongoing emergency in one se in, in, the, in the sense that it it is a time in which all laws that were passed, enacted, and, and enshrined in the constitution to ensure the the, the freedom of, of and, and, and freedom of, in, of in, in, in citizens have been systematically changed in order to give draconian powers to the, to the central and state governments to put anyone in jail for any reason or even without reason 
for any, as long as they like with no hookup coming out. Now that they do not use this more it is only because if you go beyond a certain point, you will pro provoke a, 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 a sort of a violent reaction. The point is they want to use democracy to destroy democracy. And, the, and in democracy, so long as people have the illusion that they can change things by dissenting with the government in power, uh, they will not take up arms. So you will not, in fact, start putting enough people in jail and for, and, you know, for, for or, or doing worse things than that uh, to destroy this illusion. That's the, that is the only boundary left today. So, so what you're arguing is what we have today is like an illusion of democracy. And, and uh, even in, in the mid-70s, uh, Indira Gandhi was accused of undermining institutions, whether it be the judiciary, whether it be the civil service. But do you see the, the institutions that are supposed to safeguard, uphold democracy, having been systematically weakened in the recent past, in the last seven years and a little longer? If so, would you like to elaborate if, if this is indeed the situation? Well, uh, the, the, we, we, we haven't got to quite the stage where democracy has become an illusion, but the, 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 we, because we, for example, you would not be able to talk like this and I would not be able to write the way I do if it had become an illusion. But we are clinging on to the democracy that is left because the ruling powers are afraid of shattering the illusion that democracy exists. What I wanted to say is Indira Gandhi was responsible for undermining institutions like the judiciary, like the bureaucracy. Yes, yes. And, and this yes. government too has been accused of undermining several institutions, where, whether it be law enforcing agencies like the Central Bureau of Investigation, the Income Tax Department, they've all turned into sort of weapons in the hands of the, the ruling dispensation to target their opponents. Yes, this, this has happened. This has happened systematically. Uh, I can give you chapter and verse, in a sense. There is, there is, you have to, you know, there are certain parallels which need to be, under, you know, from which we have to, you have to draw your own con conclusions. I mean, just, I'll give you one example. Uh, the, just, I think it's either retiring or just retired, the head of the National Intelligence Agency, is the same CBI officer who was deputed by a BJP government of which Adwani was the Home Minister to inquire into the murder of Harin Pandya in 2003 in, 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 in Gujarat. Um, and his name is YC Modi. Now, Mr. Modi created, did a very good job there. Within six months, he had the case ready, and 12 Muslims were sentenced to life, life imprisonment as part of a grand conspiracy to come and kill either Modi or, or another senior BJP leader as re revenge for what happened in, in Gujarat riots, you know, a year earlier. Now, that was a very fine, very well knit case, et cetera, et cetera, until 2012 when the Gujarat High Court threw out every shred of that case with the most scathing comments imaginable. But that was, in a unique way, and it never happened before, uh, you know, without precedent, an unprecedented way, when Modi came, that was reversed by the Supreme Court, you know, a bench under Justice Anand Mishra. And the, Mr. Y.C. Modi was then, at the same time, made the head of the National Intelligence Agency. Hmm. Now, you draw your own conclusions from that. I, 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 you know, may, you know, of course, if every prime minister has the right to bring in uh, people who, who, who he trusts in key positions, but there's a sort of a systematic thing to this. I can go on, okay, you know, position by position by position, including the most recent one of Mr. Asthana being brought out of the Gujarat police card a few days before he retires and made the uh, commissioner of police of Delhi. Now, this is not quite unprecedented. It's happened once or twice before on very special grounds. But the point, the point is, this is this is quite different from that. There was okay. no special ground to justify doing this. Delhi was full of first-class officers. Now, in fact, the cream of the, in fact, the cream of the police elite uh, officers elite were, were used to come to the Union Territory Carter, 
and they, they were all overlooked. Okay. Uh, I have just a few more questions given the limitations of time. Let me ask you a little bit to talk about what's happened. We talked about democracy and the weakening of democratic institutions. What's happened? I mean, I mean, how do you see the state of parliament at present? We've just witnessed the monsoon session of parliament literally and metaphorically being washed out. Now, do you see the parliament as an institution I mean, how, how do you see the change? How has it changed in the last 75 years? And, and where do you see it going? I mean, um, the problems of parliament start a long way back. I, and I will come to the, what's happened now at the, at the, at the very end. The, the parliament has been systematically criminalized. It has been criminalized by the decisions of the government of the day and every single government that has come to power in India is responsible for this, not Mr. Modi, Mr. Modi alone. And Mr. In fact, Mr. Modi, least of all, the damage was done even before he came, the BGP was able to take advantage of it because the damage had been done. Let me just very briefly tell you, you we have the largest constituencies in the world, 6,000 square kilometers, the size of our parliamentary constituency. In Britain, the size of a parliamentary constituency is 369 square kilometers. In Britain, they did not feel the need, also partly because democracy, the, the, the electorate grew very gradually, um, but they never felt the need to create a formal financing system for elections. Every other de democracy has done so. India, we followed Britain, but with, 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 and then with 6,000 uh, square kilometers to cover in, in four weeks and, and to maintain the cadres, political parties had no sources of funds. And the only one that was emerging, uh, corporate donations, were banned in 1967. They were made taxable in 1967 and then banned altogether in 1970 by the Indira Gandhi government. So let us not blame this government. Every government is responsible. The end product of that today is, as the, as the Associate for Democratic Rights has pointed out over and over again, that one third on, uh, of our central and state legislatures have criminal indictments against them. And these, about half of them, have the, the six serious crime indictments against them. Murder, kidnapping, rape, arson, armed robbery, and, and I think there's one more. Anyway, so the point is, how do you expect a parliament like this to, to actually deliver? The miracle is it does. If you look at the standing committee reports in parliament, they're excellent. Sometimes they're not as, as well informed as we would like them to be, but the people work hard. The people on the standing committees, they take their work very seriously. That is the best part of parliament. What we're seeing, the Natak we see on, the, on, on television is the worst part of parliament. What Mr. Modi's government has done is okay, is to say, express the contempt for parliament that was growing in the people in the most brutal way possible. Like saying, I don't care whether you're there or not. I don't care about your dissent. I don't care about your views. I will use my brute majority and a variety of techniques to make sure that you know, I put key bills through when there are minimum number of opposition people actually sitting in the house and using those te techniques to pass whatever laws I want. That's what he's been doing. But we destroyed our parliamentary system a long, long time ago by first not creating an electoral financing system and then by and destroying the have, If I can add, we have the most opaque, non transparent system of electoral bonds. And we already right. know that the bulk of the money, at least three fourths or more of this money, is going to the Bharati Janta Party. It's gone to the Bharati Janta Party. But I'll tell you one thing in 2024, if this, if, if, if the government changes, the new government will not change this law and will take 75% of the money. Okay. That I guarantee you, and I hope I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, I should personally, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, you know, um, do trash chit. You know, okay. After trash chit, you will atone for your sins. Exactly. Okay. In front of the now, camera. 
Okay. My, my, my last question to you, you know, you, we started our conversation by you saying why you feel not just despair, but a sense of despondency when you look at India's future. Uh, we are, the occasion is the 75th anniversary of India's independence. Why are you so despondent? I mean, let me divide this question into two parts. What do you think is likely to happen when the next general elections take almost three years away? We are looking at April, May of 2024. That, that's the, the near term, so to say. And when you look ahead beyond 2024, I mean, what, do you, are you as despondent? Uh, do you remain as pessimistic? Do you think the future of this country, we describe ourselves as the world's largest democracy, is very, very bleak? Well, first, let me be just slightly, uh, you know, elaborate what I said earlier. My despair is on the economy. My despair is not on the people of India. On the contrary, I see a kind of a, a flowering of an intelligentsia, which I, I think there are very few countries in the world that have, you know, and it's happening because the intelligentsia is feeling threatened by what is happening in the government today. You know, that is, that, 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 that is one. Second, the, the, the degree of innovativeness in small industry, you know, in farmers. I've been studying the farm problem very closely for, for the last nine months because of what has happened. And there are many solutions and the farmers have been able to find some of them themselves without Mr. Modi's help. But the agriculture has been in a crisis precisely because it was so, farmers are so phenomenally successful in the past. We have a crisis of massive overproduction in just about everything, which is why you can't suddenly wipe out all market protections for the, for, for the, for the producers and say, we're going to create a free market because in a free market of, of surplus, the, 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 the producers' prices will be driven down into the ground and they will die one by one. So, you know, this, this is, I, I think that the people of India will come to their senses and I see that and, and they, will, they, they will join together either to bring the BJP RSS to its senses or to vote at an opposition coalition into power. I think that a new kind of coalition around issues is beginning to develop in the opposition. You can see it in the, the letters that the 10 opposition leaders, including Rahul Gandhi and so on, have been writing systematically to the president. They're always on issues. You can uh, you, you look at the, the, the dinner that Mr. Kapil Sibyl hosted the other day. You know, every pol major political party, including the Biju Janta Dal, was present. Um, we have, there is a realization that issues now matter, that India's future matters. It, it, is, it is being promoted. It has been created precisely by that intelligence you were talking about. Okay. You look at, you look at the, 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 the Twitter you know, and, 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 and WhatsApp and so on, and look at the alternate press and see what's happening. Okay. Let's see how they talk. All right. All right. I, I thought I had asked you my last question, but I have one more question for you. You know, many argue <clears throat> that one of the biggest successes of Mr. Narendra Modi as the Prime Minister of India is that he converted India's multi-party democracy into like an American-style presidential system where two individuals, the personalization of politics. The BJP on its own got 31% of the vote in 2014, which increased to around 35, 37% in 2019. The NDA had about 37% of the vote in 2014, but, and then and almost around 45%. But we, we have the Westminster style of parliamentary democracy, first past the post, winner takes all, but half of the people of India who voted did not vote for either the BJP or the NDA. But now that old NDA doesn't exist with two of the BJP's oldest coalition partners having gone their own ways, uh, Shiromani Akali Dal and the Shiv Sena. So how do you see the, the political scenario building up in, in, in the next two and a half years or so? Well, I, I, I cannot give you an answer of what will happen but I can only talk, about, or rather, I can hazard guesses. But guesses are not what you want. All I can, all I can talk about is what needs to happen. Um, the 
the first of all, I think you must understand that a coalition to win an election alone without a, a, a clear policy platform that all are agreed upon and that brings back hope to the people of India will not win. Because the BJP has, and the RSS, the RSS has 86,000 shakhas. They had 40,000 in 2014. They had 86,000 in 2019. They may be 100,000 today. There are at least 10 million foot soldiers that they turn loose. These are disciplined people. They're relatively honest people compared to the others. They are not the kind of uh, you know, party workers who are predatory in, in the other parties or criminal, as we know, uh, they say in UP, North Bihar, et cetera. So the point is they have that advantage and they can unleash them wherever they want to. And they point out all the little things that they've done at a level that never even catches the eye of the press. What are the things that an ordinary man worries about a, a villager? Um, his, his, his safety of his land, which means he does not disputes, his children's education, health, you know, and um, health, health issues, and maybe, I mean, I think that is the fourth one, I can't remember. The security now, of issues, women, the security of women. Security of women, well, that, yeah, that, but I think that's becoming a very important issue too, you're right, but I had the fifth one in mind, doesn't matter. The point is that for that, who do they turn to if there's something, the threat to them? They, they turn to the local big wigs. Say those who know the the, the police thanedar, those who know the the, the, the local sub subdivision officer, and so on. Now that grassroots worker who can be an intermediary between the government and the ordinary people, and you need them because we are so, so such a vast population. That grassroots has to be honest, and it's been you know predatory or disappearing. In the case of Congress, in state after state, this just vanished. The people have gone and joined somewhere else. So we, we, you know, we're not going to be able to build a coalition of simply parties putting together. Okay. It's got to be around issues. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for giving us your time to the viewers and listeners of NewsClick. Thank you very much for explaining uh, in, in detail uh, why you are at one level despondent and despair about the future of the Republic of India. And at the same time, you are not completely hopeless. You see some signs of optimism and why you see those signs of hope. Well, thank you so much once again, Prem Shankar Jha for being with us. And on behalf of all the viewers and listeners, uh, best wishes to you and keep watching News Click. Thank <laughs> you.